Hi. Um, yeah, I think my gardening is a wild overstatement. I have like two cilantro plants and a couple of cauliflower and spinach plants, so on automated irrigation. So, um, but yeah, it's something and it gives me, I mean, I enjoy it, so that's what counts, right? Um, well, thank you for having me. A little bit of my background, I do, I work at Series Imaging. I've been there for the last uh, three and a half years now, working and helping growers apply remote sensing imagery to farming applications and make decisions off of that. Uh, before I came on a series, I was working at Gallo Winery as a GIS analyst. So I was using different types of platforms and imagery in viticultural purposes. And I also had a little bit of experience in teaching GIS remote sensing at University of Pacific and Modesto Junior College while I was wrapping up my um, PhD in hydrology. So I was working with apple growers down in Chile and wine grape growers up in California in satellite imagery. So I have a lot of different experiences in imagery from all, kind of all across the board in different crop types. So happy to talk about any of those, uh, any of those um, topics of interest. But today I'm just going to give a very high level overview of remote sensing and how we use it at series. And I want this to just be like a, a very conversational um, talk. So if anything strikes your interest or you have any questions on the fly, feel free to raise your hand and I'm happy to just kind of like talk through it. So before I get started, has anyone used a drone or used any sort of satellite or aerial imagery before? A couple of people? Okay, so there's a couple of um, novices, maybe amateur remote sensing scientists in the room. Great, so essentially if you've taken any measurements without physically touching a plant or that soil, you are remotely sensing, you're remotely collecting data, right? So remote sensing is collecting data without physically coming in contact with that surface of interest. So what we will be talking about today in remote sensing is using aerial imagery, so from a plane uh, as the platform. But I, you can use drones, you can use satellites, there's a lot of different platforms. So there's a couple of things before I talk about how we collect imagery at Series Imaging. Um, a couple of things that are really important in collecting imagery are the spatial, spectral, and temporal resolutions. So depending on your size of your crop and the frequency of monitoring, um, all of these things are very important in making sure you make the right decision unique to your crop and your geographic area and size, right? So again, I'm at Series Imaging, I love aerial imaging, and I think that there's a very uh, broad application for that, but it's not always the best um, for different types of remote sensing applications. So if you want to be monitoring you know, the whole globe or like a five acre plot, there's also different platforms that you can use. So, one of those things is the spatial resolution. How big is it? So that's the pixel size, right? You can be dealing with five centimeter pixels, very small, or you could be dealing with 30 or 100 meter pixels for like global measurements. So however big those pixels are is just your spatial resolution. Spectral resolution, um, that's a little bit more technical because that is going to determine how many wavelengths of light along the electromagnetic spectrum you are harnessing to make different calculations. So all, if you've been using a drone, you're probably familiar with NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, and you're using two different wavelengths. Um, however, you can go into hyperspectral remote sensing. We're using hundreds of contiguous bands all along the light spectrum. If you're wanting to collect lots and lots of data and do a lot of rig rigorous calculations um, to explore new vegetation indexes. Or you could just do multi-spectral where you're being very precise um, on the wavelengths that you want for very specific purposes, whether you're looking at terrestrial remote sensing on the earth surface, on the, on the land, or if you're looking at aquatic environments. So just depending on you know, what your interests are, that will determine what spectral resolutions you want. And lastly is temporal resolution, how frequently you're collecting that data. So 
for weather purposes, you know, do, do you want your imagery to keep coming back to you several times or with it, several times within the hour or within the day? Or is once a month or once a week okay? You know, those, all of those temporal resolutions will change depending on how frequently you need to be monitoring changes across the Earth's surface. So those are some of the most important things in deciding what's the best platform to be using and what kind of data sets you want to be working with. So before I kind of dig into what we do and the unique resolutions that we use for agricultural remote sensing, feel free to ask any questions right now before I go in a different direction. Nope? Okay. Very good. So going into series imaging, we are, uh, we are aerial based. We started out as a drone company um, back in 2013. That was a very popular endeavor for a lot of companies, was using drones. It was this huge surge of a lot of different drone platforms popping up. And there's still like very useful applications for drone platforms. But for us, um, we wanted to be able to work with a lot of growers in a given afternoon. And drones just wouldn't enable that. Additionally, the sensors that we were building, um, the payload, just couldn't be carried from a drone. It wasn't a practical thing for us to be using. Um, so for our payloads and for the amount of acreage we wanted to cover when the sun was directly overhead within two hours of solar noon, um, Aerial was the best platform. So we are what we like to call platform agnostic. We're more focused on the data itself than the actual platform. So if drones end up being a good platform for us to use in the future, then we're gonna move that direction, but for right now, Aerial is the, the best platform for us. So um, we are very interested in collecting, like I said, um, collecting the best data as possible and then the platform is secondary. So we started in 2013. We are actually, uh, we've surpassed 80 members now. We're about 80 to 85 people at Ceres based in Oakland, California. But we have, um, we have employees kind of scattered through the PAC Northwest, California, Midwest, and Australia as well, so, yes? Does the spectral resolution change dramatically depending on the time of day that you take the measurement? That's a good question. Um, not necessarily. So the only caveat to that, so our spectral resolution is consistent within um, solar noon. So we fly within two hours of solar noon, but um, there have been instances for thermal data, so that's not spectral, that's you know, sensing the temperature of the Earth's surface. Uh, we have flown outside solar noon for thermal imaging before, so that's a good question. Uh, and again, flying a lot of different regions, so with those different regions, um, we began in tree nut crops, pistachios, walnuts, almonds, but now we fly everything from wine grapes to tomatoes to pineapple and sugar cane uh, macadamia nuts, rice, all sorts of different uh, crops, vines, trees, uh, row crops, and forage. So, And how we began, so with those crops, when we started in tree nut crops, we began in tandem with the University of California Cooperative Extension. So this flight up here is the same flight done across about 160 acre almond orchard. And this was working in collaboration with Blake Sandin at the University of California Extension. And so what's really cool about this flight is that we are looking at the same time, the same instance of time across the same orchard, but just looking at different spectral indexes and different ways of processing the imagery that tells us a very different story. So, Walking it back, the NDVI, like I mentioned, stands for the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, and it's using the red and near-infrared wavelengths of light. And this index has been used for a very long time in military and agricultural purposes that basically shows you the uniformity or the um, photosynthetic biomass, so you can look at the uniformity of a canopy across a field or orchard. And it's very useful and accurate. It's been used for a long time. so. It's a robust index. It's the most widely researched index in literature, so a lot of people know it and trust it and can use it in, com in comparing crops across seasons. However, there was a few drawbacks in agriculture. There was a few hangups that could be improved upon. One of those being 
when you see a weak spot, when you see a lower vigor spot like this, it's not specific to why. You can't tell, when you see a weak spot, you just know it's not thriving, but you don't know if it's due to a water issue or a fertilizer or a soil issue. It's very hard and it's, it's left up to the, the grower to figure out what's going on, which can just lead you down another rabbit hole. Additionally, when you find a weak spot, this is usually due to consistent water stress through the season. So you're usually a little late in the game to solve the problem when you find an issue based on NDVI. And so for agriculture, what we wanted to do is one, let's be a little bit more specific. Let's figure out ways to image a field or orchard that can help a grower be much more pinpointed and precise in, in tackling a water management or a nutrient management from, a, from those two different angles. And secondly, let's be proactive about this. Let's not be um, catching problems in the middle of the season, but let's start seeing water stress earlier on and ident identify it and then get in front of that problem so that you can monitor and manage everything uniformly through the season. So proactive and specific. So that's what we're looking at here with water stress and chlorophyll. So with water stress, again, same instance of time, you can see everything was being irrigated uniformly on this left third of the block but you can see there's roughly 15 to 18 blocks that were um, being treated with high water and nutrients at that time, and that's what all those little green rectangles are across the block. So it was really, really cool because you could see, uh, if you were a grower, you would be able to go out and see areas that were getting high amounts of water and areas that were being deprived of water. So that's, again, being proactive, being able to tackle those issues early on. And then secondly, if you wanted to see a little bit of a different picture, a different angle, you can see areas that have low chlorophyll, typically related to low nitrogen uptake, but can be related to other macronutrients or pest pressures as well. But still, really great, um, really great and informative imagery for a grower tackling those two problems that they were experiencing. So I'll pause there because there's a lot of information. Happy to answer any questions. Yes. Oh. Um, do you, does series look at if there's like a control, like you're new, trying to do integrated pest management or a new type of control on one part of your farm versus like say you split this orchard in half and you mm -hmm. tried the beneficial nematodes from the last talk on one half and the other, do you look at pressures and stresses that come after those controls? Yeah, that's a good question. So I was not involved on this specific project, and this was focused primarily on validating the imagery with pressure bombs and with tissue samples to look at percent nitrogen correlations to the chlorophyll and water uptake to the on the ground to water stress uh, modeling. Um, from like a pest pressure perspective, we haven't executed that I'm aware of, we have not executed a project yet specific to pest and disease management, but if we were, then we would likely have a control group. Yeah, good question. Okie dokie. So um, we have a, quite a few correlation curves showing what we were modeling in the imagery to what the cooperative extension was sampling on the ground across a couple of years. But just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, on the y-axis is measured stem water potential, so what the cooperative extension was sampling via pressure bomb on the ground, and they wanted to correlate their ground samples to what we were modeling with imagery across the x-axis. So you can see data was taken from 2014 to 2015, two different seasons across different months uh, through the season, and you can see basically when the almond trees were stressed when they were basically showing red in the pixels down here. The, the cooperative extension was modeling, you know, negative 25 bars, give or take. And then conversely, when we were seeing those blue pixels and the trees were very happy and transpiring, pushing lots of water through, we were typically seeing, you know, negative seven-ish bars on the pressure bomb samples. And of course, there is spread in the data 
has anyone taken a pressure sample or a pressure bomb sample before? Um, so there's a, it's very unique to the person taking the sample. Um, so it's very sensitive to the time in the day. So that's one of the challenges if a grower is taking a pressure bomb reading uh, to, model, uh, to monitor the stress of a plant. Uh, but it also is a little bit subjective from person to person. So there's oftentimes spread within the data of just that sample set too. So, but it was still pretty good. This was um, very exciting to see a pretty strong correlation between what cooperative extension was seen on the ground and what we were seeing um, through our imagery. And we have similar curves for the chlorophyll with correlations to percent nitrogen as well, and I'm happy to share those afterward, but for sake of time, just kind of want to keep pushing through and get to the fun stuff, which is how we've seen this imagery used with growers. Um, I'm just going to walk you through a couple of really neat patterns and trends that we've seen with growers that have helped them catch problems early, which is what our main goal is. So this is one example. So going back to that resolution of imagery that we talked about, we are looking at roughly 20 to 30 centimeter spatial resolution with our imagery. And that enables us to see at a very granular level where there might be like plugged emitters or where Sometimes a gopher, if you have like subsurface irrigation, if a gopher goes through and like chews up the lines and you wouldn't be able to see it from above ground, uh, we're able to see that with that granular spatial resolution. So this is what happened here. Um, there was a clogged line. You can see that yellow line across this whole sea of blue and green, which is really awesome. So if you're a farmer walking around in this, say this is 50 acres, and all of a sudden you get your image and you see that clogged line, um, in our app, you can drop a little pin or note, a little balloon, and then you see yourself moving around as a blue circle, so you can just go like right to that line and fix it. So it saves you a ton of time and just enables you to be very precise and targeted. Yes? So I think all the measures that you've shown so far have been, uh, they've been sensor measurements taken, taken on the canopy and on the plants. But do you also do um, do you also do remote sensing of say the the um, the soil and also of the the air? That is a good question. So uh, with our imagery, we are looking at the top of the canopy. There is also remote sensing beneath the canopy and through the canopy. Um, there's a lot of robotics research going on with remote sensing underneath the canopy or of the soil, we are focused on taking the temperature of the, the canopy itself rather than the soil that can also be related to what's going on in the soil. And that is what's being shown here. So we're, if you zoom in and you see this black in between the rows, we remove the background soil and shadows so you're only looking at the canopy. If a grower is very interested in looking at the soil as well, we can leave that out, but we are primarily interested in, in the trees or the plants themselves, and that has been the unanimous need from the growers that we work with. So good question. And lastly, so we talked about the spectral resolution and the, temp the spatial resolution. Now we're going to move to the temporal resolution. So we work with pilots that fly nearly weekly in the regions that we are operating in, but the grower chooses when they want their flights to happen. So it is left up to the grower to choose their frequency of their temporal resolution, which is great because there are a lot of different crops in a lot of different regions, and based on where you're growing and what you're growing, you're going to want a very different frequency. So a tomato grower in the Fresno area will have a very different timing and frequency of flights versus a almond grower in Chico. So that's allowed, um, that's allowed us to grow and keep our growers happy. And how it works is essentially you, you pick the weeks that you want to fly, whether it's four, six, eight flights then our pilots that are flying in that area, if, you, if they're flying overhead on the week that you want flown, they collect the imagery, and they do what's called site-specific flying. So like a drone would fly over your orchard or field, the pilot flies lawnmower style over that block. 
Then the imagery is processed in Oakland, and we process you know, the water stress, chlorophyll, NDVI, thermal data, and that imagery is delivered back via your app on your phone or on your desktop. And one of the most important pieces, if you walk away from this, the main thing today is that we, our imagery is a service. And one of the biggest hangups in agriculture was that growers would get, their, would get their imagery and they would see a pattern or a trend, but they wouldn't really know what to do with it. They would see a lot of different colors on the map, but they wouldn't understand or know how to interpret it and make it actionable on the ground. So when you get your imagery, we have a team of people that are growers of wine grapes, almonds, walnuts, different types of crops. Uh, oftentimes PCA licensed or CCA, and they will help with interpreting the imagery. So they have knowledge of agriculture. They know how to manage things and deduce what's going on, but they also can look at the imagery and say like, hey, based on this line right here, they'll drop a balloon and say it looks like there might be a clogged line. Or if you overlay soil data and look at some changes in water stress from red to green, it looks like the red area that's having, that's um, experiencing water stress is actually correlated to a sandy soil based on the soil data that we'll overlay. So really helps drive home connecting the imagery on your computer to what you're actually going to do about it. A few other cool stories. Um, this image right here, uh, our grower in the Modesto area got this image and said, hey, you know, when we flew, uh, it, was in the, it was the first week of July, and he saw this red square and said like, hey, I just drove by that area the other day and I saw water running, um, so I know that there was irrigation going on. So he went out and checked it, and the irrigation had only been turned on about 50%. So when you're driving by and you see water running, it's very hard to figure out like, was that 50% or 100%? So he turned the water on all the way, and you know, by drawing out Tracing it out, uh, he was able to calculate it was 13 acres. And by July 26th or so, so about 20 days later, he was able to change the blue square from red to green. So it was a really cool story and a very easy um, $0 fix. Uh, a couple other patterns that uh, we help with interpreting or that we'll see are you know, red lines from the outside when we start to see these red lines popping up on the outside of an, of an orchard or a field, oftentimes that's related to plugged emitters, um, plugged valves. So you can start to see it encroaching in, and it's a really good time to deduce like, hey, it's time for me to flush my lines, or go out and check and possibly replace emitters if that's the next best step. Um, this other pattern here, similar to the one that we were just looking at, where you can see you know, manifolds being blocked or Line, drip lines being blocked, which whether it's above ground or below can be very hard to see just doing a drive-by or, or driving around the perimeter of an orchard. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more larger scale. So for example, looking at all of these blocks across here that are in blue, but this one block that's in yellow, this can oftentimes be due to just scheduling when you need irrigation. So if this is happening in the middle of summer, maybe this is a clue to be irrigating a little bit more frequently um, or changing up the amount of water that you're putting on. Uh, another pattern that we've seen fairly often is looking at pr uh, uniform pressure distribution, so the efficiency of an irrigation system across the landscape. And for example, here, a pipe broke, so water was not being delivered 100% to that block. And you can see where the main line was going through that vineyard, and it was losing pressure from the inside, where the main line was, outward. So that's another uh, really uh, unique pattern to that, that issue. Another pattern, plugged emitters. This was a good one because when we saw these little red dots popping up, we were thinking, hey, you know, maybe these trees are getting stressed because water's not being delivered or maybe just irrigation wasn't running. So we'll see if this is an actual problem based on the system, we'll do another flight when the irrigation is running. So irrigation was off, 
weren't sure, but when we did the flight while irrigation was running, we can see those red little dots there. And the grower went out and saw that the emitters were capped and not putting water out. So we're able to uncap the emitters, fix the issue, and um, improve the uniformity and the water getting to the plants. Uh, row crops, so we looked at a lot of perennials, a lot of trees and vines, but we've seen a lot of uh, good use cases for, for row crops, whether the tomatoes are drip irrigated or furrow irrigated. So this is another uh, good use case right here where we can see that the water was just not getting pushed all the way uniformly through the field. And so that's a very clear case right there. We can see everything looks pretty good over here, but just not getting pushed all the way up. Um, and sometimes they're not as clear cut as irrigation system. You could be doing everything right for soil management, for irrigation management, pruning, everything could be growing, going great. But we all know like nature's nature. So I see a lot of different patterns due to coyotes, gophers, pigs, and crows. And so this one, we're trying to figure out what is going on here because these are four corners. It doesn't look like a pressure issue. You know, maybe it's a main line, maybe there's two main lines right here, I don't know. We met with the grower and walked through and he goes, I know exactly what this is. I have crows. He was in Woodland and he has a whole bunch of crows and they go for the outside corners because it's an easy, low hanging fruit, no pun intended. And he went after it. Those crows just keep going after the corners. So he was using the imagery to figure out when the crows were going after which blocks. And so just yanking off the emitters. And again, um, going through pests and animals being animals. You can see here, this is just looking at the raw thermal imagery. So we were looking at a lot of spectral imagery, looking at NDVI and water stress, but now we're looking at just raw thermal. So you can see here, no leaks, everything looks super uniform. It's a little bit hard to see with the resolution on the monitor, but on, uh, on a desktop or on your phone, you can see like, do you see all these little black dots everywhere? So a, a group of coyotes went through and just made a whole mess. So this was in July when it was getting really hot and the coyotes were thirsty. So they found a water source and they just ripped through, made a mess of the drip lines um, in this vineyard. And you can see where they all popped up. You have to go fix and clean up the mess, unfortunately, but at least you're able to see where it is and fix it. So again, as I mentioned, we are imagery as a service. Bottom line, if you get all of this fancy cutting edge imagery, and it's great, it's very informative, it doesn't mean anything if you don't put it into action and you don't understand what's going on. So we love facilitating imagery literacy, understanding how to read those images, how to interpret patterns and trends, and then turn it into action on the ground. So that's, that's one of the really enjoyable things about doing what we do, um, and we love working with our growers. So uh, from there, I'm happy to answer any other questions that may have come up. Otherwise, uh, I did bring a few cards, but um, thank you very much for letting me come up and talk today. Thank you. Oh. Do you work with maybe growers or clients that have um, you know areas of land that are less uniform, like something that's not? I mean, is it mostly like for larger plots that have the same kind of plants, and how does that change when you're doing the imaging for something that maybe has different stuff going on, or like if it were some permaculture <laughs> where it would be all kinds of stuff? But you know, how would that work? Yeah, so we work with some growers that we work with are predominantly like one or two different types of crops, but we also work with growers that have you know, 10 to 15 different types of row crops and forage and things that they're all rotating. We work with some organic growers that are, you know, just really focused on using the imagery to monitor uniformity, but also when they're rotating crops, monitoring the nutrient health and deciding when it's a good time to, to rotate their crop. So uh, I hope that answers your question. We work with a lot of different types of growers that are growing different types of things. And so from there, if they want their their imagery, if they want their flights to be executed at different times for certain crop types, we're flexible around that. Yeah. Have you 
encountered from officer fools and what is your take on that and um, what does the data show? Yeah, so you're talking about um, like low elevation spray units like crop circles in the Midwest and there's a few in California. Yes. Okay, so that is mostly in the Midwest. Um, but I do know that the imagery is really valuable from the uniformity of water application in that system because depending on where the water, where the water pressure is highest on that system, it's a very good indicator. The imagery is a really good indicator of seeing when there's pressure loss through that system. So if it's not being distributed from the center all the way outward, you can see that lack of uniformity through that crop circle. Yes. Who owns the data? That's a good question. Um, so the data is um, the data is owned by the customer, uh, but we can also we series is allowed to use the data on a larger scale. So we do not give away an individual's data set. We, will, we protect our customers on the individual label, label level, but we will also use the data on a larger aggregated, um, in a larger aggregated purpose. And does this get made available for research purposes? Yeah, we, um, we so I'll answer your question with the question, using that research for individual research projects that are going on or on a larger scale like university level. Yep. So we are still undergoing some research projects. Um, a couple of projects that come to mind, we just finished a project with the Rice Institute in Australia that came out and that was a really cool study looking at the chlorophyll and red edge in identifying nitrogen uniformity in rice plots. And then we also have a project going on in Tehama County and one at the tail end of the project with the Department of Water Resources in the San Joaquin County Resource Conservation District in um, the Stockton, San Joaquin area. So, yep, our data is used in a lot of different research settings. So, is there any application? Oh, okay, back. Uh, I just have one question about, um, did, um, do you have any efforts going around machine learning to um, you know, look over the data sets and kind of guess what's going on or make suggestions of the training such algorithms? Yeah. yeah, some softball questions here. Um, yeah, so we are, um, we are actively undergoing machine learning, artificial intelligence with the data. Um, the next step, so I talked about when we got off the ground, <laughs> Uh, when we literally got off the ground with the company, we wanted to be proactive with our imagery, but the next step is going from proactive imagery to more advanced analytics with that data. So now that we've been going on for a couple of years, we want to take our data to the next level and give our, give especially customers that have been working with us for the last like three to five years, start looking at interseasonal analytics. And then also, once we're starting uh, with machine learning and AI, we want to start picking up anomalies and be able to not just have our customer success team helping to interpret the data, but also um, through artificial intelligence and machine learning, be able to start picking up those anomalies um, automatedly. Yeah, good question. Yes. So are, there, are there other companies, or are you thinking about looking at this technology for fire control in the wildlands? Yeah, we are predominantly focused in agriculture. And I think it's really important, taking a step back and talking about companies in general, I think it's really important to start off very focused on a specific subject. There is a very useful application for remote sensing in identifying fire fuels and um, looking at areas that are more susceptible for these catastrophic fires. And I, I came from the Center for Spatial Technologies and Remote Sensing at UC Davis, the C-STARS lab. And they're doing a lot of research. There's a lot of people using much larger data sets, and that's where satellite imagery can become very useful. Or even you can definitely couple aerial drone imagery and satellite imagery to start dialing in and identifying fire fuels. So that's a really interesting topic. It's not what we're focused on, and we want to stay focused on agriculture right now for the well-being of our customers and 
you know, advance there. If it's something that we can be useful for in the future, we'll be happy to collaborate. But um, yeah, really, really interesting and useful, uh, powerful tool for remote sensing in, in fire, um, in, in fire prone environments. You had a question? What format is the images in? Okay, so good question. The predominant format is using it in the user interface. So just like, um, so it's not, a, it's not a native file when the grower is interacting with the data um, online, but they can download their imagery on the fly as a geotiff, which is a geo-registered TIFF file. So that, it's a, a TIFF file if you want to actually download the image and keep it for yourself as a grower. What I mean is, is it infrared? Is oh, okay, so not the file itself. So not the actual file, but the spectral resolution of the imagery. Yeah, good question. So for, it's, it's different spectral resolutions for the different types of images. If we are looking at the NDVI, it's the near infrared and red, it's two different wavelengths. We use five wavelength regions of light from the visible to near infrared for the chlorophyll imagery, and that's our, our own index that we use. And then for the water stress, we use a hybrid of thermal and spectral resolution from the visible to near infrared. Yep, yeah, thank you. Another one? Yep. Uh, yeah, the, uh, some years ago, like in the uh, early 70s, um, I was next to a guy's field in Idaho and he showed me these sensors and they collected the, the I don't, they, they collected humidity, not humidity, soil moisture readings. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this was a sugar beet crop and they could tell him when was the best time to turn on the water and when he didn't need to. So, it took the guesswork out of his air gauge mm -hmm. and uh, significantly increased, like 15 to 20 percent, over his neighbor who was farming the old way. Are you guys interested in getting into that level of detail and readings? And because he had they had sensors in the field that collected the information, sent it to a satellite where it was then downloaded. <coughs> to the office of the people who actually interpreted the data. Yeah, so two things about that. One is that we love coupling remote sensing, imagery in general, with ground data. Remote sensing isn't a panacea, it's not going to be a cure-all. Even in research, you oftentimes use ground data to connect and validate and correlate what you're seeing on the ground and then extrapolating it across what you're seeing through those images. So I think, you know, oftentimes we, we work with, in tandem with ground sensors, whether it be soil moisture or weather stations or whatnot, um, but can also help with, with extrapolating those point sensors across the imagery. And then secondly, with the, with the return that you can get with applying those tools, I think this goes for a lot of ag tech tools in general and, and really helps tie the theme of this conference together, is that no matter what tool you're using in ag tech, whether you are using a, a weather station, soil moisture sensor, imagery, if you use it in the right way, that's where you can see a huge return on your investment. But it just goes back to taking whatever tools you're using in your toolbox and employing them. So with us, depending on the crop type and the extent of the issues that we're seeing, we'll see anywhere from a three to 30X return on investment with our customers, just depending on how much acreage and the crop type and the market price of that year. So there's a very wide range, but just rings true with what your friend was seeing in Idaho with his soil moisture sensors as well. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, thank you so much.